All right. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Charles. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah. Good to be here. Nice. I guess we can start. Do you mind introducing yourself a little bit more and telling us how you interact with no code, low code in your day to day? Tom, why don't, why don't you go first? I've got to change my background to catch up with you here. So why don't you go first on introductions? Okay, cool. Thanks very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, so my name is Tom Shaw. Um, I've been working in tech for about 20 years now. Um, and those 20 years, I've been building tools for developers, for QA folks. And over the past 20 years, there's been this evolution of tools and like who's using them, how they're being used. Um, I work in gaming. I've worked for companies like Activision, Riot Games. I'm working for DigiGames at the moment. And um, yeah, I'm a big fan of what No Code does, like the fact that they can really democratize the tooling, which is something we haven't really seen in the past. So I'm really big into the future of No Code. I'm really interested to see where it goes. Yeah, and I'm, I'm Charles Caldwell. I lead products at Logi Analytics. I've, I've uh, been banging around in the analytics world probably for about 20 years with a focus on helping human beings make better decisions using using data. And now what I do is I deliver a platform that helps product teams get analytic feature sets embedded into uh, their applications with a focus on, on making that as low code as possible, of course, supported by APIs so the teams can get it embedded and customized and, and automated. Um, and that, that is another area, analytics specifically, where democratization has been an important trend. And we're constantly asking the question, how do we help uh, citizen analysts, citizen developers participate in understanding information, generating insights, and taking action on that insight? Okay, so we just talked on, touched on the democratization aspect. What are some other benefits maybe to the business that using low code or no code can give? Uh, Charles, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I'll jump in on this. I mean, I think so. So, probably the the, the first thing I'll jump in on is um, I'm not I'm not big on this big monster we call the business. So, like we we are the business. I don't find me someone in an organization who is not the the business. And I think actually that is one of the main values as we now start to bring a, a set of tooling to those folks that we often call the business where they can start to communicate both in a language they understand and that we understand. So they can get their hands on solutioning in a way that's productive to them, to solving problems, but also uh, we technical folks can recognize those solutions as working code. That is the gold standard in agile development, working code over anything else. And we can take those, um, Maybe they're prototypes, maybe they're MVPs. There's the kind of different models for how we collaborate, but we can take basically what is a, a first iteration and as needed, uh, extended, augmented using um, higher code uh, where needed. So I really think it, it is, for me, it's around collaboration between teams that have very different skill sets and, and very different sets of expertise. And it does help us gel um, as the business, the organization with a with a common goal. Tom? Um, one of the real sort of benefits that um, we've seen at Digit Games is that um, like these no code solutions, they allow us to reduce the barrier to entry. So whenever we have new folks joining the company, uh, we don't require like senior level engineers to perform tasks like such as rolling out new infrastructure or uh, rolling out new game worlds um, because we use no code solutions like from day one we could bring an intern in to digits and on day one they can create new game worlds they can deploy to production that, that sort of barrier to entry that used to be there is it's just disappeared um, because we have these like no code solutions and that's so exciting the idea that you know an intern can come in and hit the ground running and you know you run up deploying to production very quickly um, one question I do hear a lot around no code is how do you bring the uh, safety checks that you have in a standard development process, the peer review, um, QA into a no code environment? How do you uh, build in a safety net there? Tom, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, we build tools that anybody can use. So we kind of build them in like layers, like an onion. 
So from day one, you can go in and use a handful of tools that we provide. And then based on the work you need to do, you can kind of drill down and do more complex tasks, more like uh, risky tasks, maybe like rolling out to production, for example. And we just control that through permissions. So the tools themselves are fairly basic, um, but we just decide what can be performed by who, just using like um, role-based access or uh, having like user accounts locked down through GitLab, which is where we drive all our automation through. Um, so we build the tools to be as accessible as possible, but then we just lock down the access um, different ways. Yeah, and I, that, that integration to the CI CD process, I think is, is um, really important. And this is um, sort of reinventing different processes um, just because the tool set looks a little bit different, I think is a, is a mistake some organizations will fall into versus falling back as, as Tom is doing on best practices. Like, hey, it doesn't matter what the tool set is per se. We know how to deploy code. We know how to manage risk around that. Uh, we already have standards for, you know, risky changes versus things that are safe um, and, and kind of how we let different folks play in the sandbox with code reviews or not code reviews, UX reviews, acceptance testing. So I think all of that, the, the, the only trick there, and it's really not a trick, we've got frameworks for these too, just helping keep the participants understand kind of what their responsibilities are and what their expectations uh, are as they're working with the tool sets. Um, and, and again, bringing them into the team, um, like everything else, it becomes a, a, a team sport, it becomes collaborative, and those, those folks are generally feeling supported, not controlled when, when you do it, right? Right. It's not a negative, it's a, it's a positive. It gives them confidence, they're they will take more risks, which at the end of the day, that's what we want all of our teams doing is innovating and taking risks, just the, the appropriate risks so that we're getting the right result. Charles, I know that you actually make a low-code, no-code product. When you're actually going in and designing it, how do you think about the roles that are built into your product, um, where to put in caps and limits on certain roles and give, you know, maybe more freedom to others. Yeah. So, and, and for, for this audience, this won't be a surprising answer. Uh, it's, it's all about focusing in on personas. So who, who are these folks? What are their goals and what skills, capabilities, and preferences do they, do they bring to the table for solving those goals? Um, and then how do we give them the most usable experience? And, and it, it really comes down to having some discipline around saying, hey, I'm, I'm only going to put a certain amount of cognitive load on a given persona, so much complexity. And that generally means cutting off some capability. And there's not there's no sort of hard answer here. It really does come down to what is this person trying to accomplish um, and what's kind of appropriate for their skills and abilities. And then it, you also want to look at the ecosystem. So I think the, the, the thing to stress here is that low code, no code isn't really just about low code, no code. It's about existing in an overall ecosystem. And I, you know, the, the, the snarky thing that I'll say is that somebody who does assembly language thinks C++ is low code, right? And somebody who does C++ thinks, <laughs> JavaScript is low code. So, you know, what is this thing that we call low code, no code? It's just another layer of abstraction. So the imagining where the handoffs are between the teams and how the collaboration works, I think is also important because that's where you sort of say, I'm not really limiting this person. What I'm doing is deciding what's most appropriate for them. And then where is the handoff to the next persona? And what does that persona look like? And that's where maybe I increase the cognitive load or change the cognitive load a little bit or the complexity or the tasks. So that's, that's really how I think about it is one, not in isolation. And then two, no surprise, it's all about the, the, about the persona definition. And then we actually had a question come in for Tom. Uh, the Facebook outage is being blamed on a commit that automatically went through without human oversight. How do you try to mitigate risks like this without having to resort to, you know, people needing to be in every server room everywhere all the time? Yeah, that's a really tough question. <laughs> um, it's just about having like um, good practices in place. And um, we do use bots quite heavily in, in digits. And there always is a certain amount of risk, like something can slip through quite easily. Uh, trying to reduce that blast radius so you know that if a, a change doesn't get out, 
you know what the blast radius is and you know how to roll back. It just sounds like the Facebook um, outage that the blast radius was so huge that they hadn't prepared for such a, a big sort of um, downtime event. Um, but yeah, just like best practices, make sure that um, the right sort of peer reviews are being done, automated checks are in place. And if you have to have somebody ticking a box at the end of the day for a, a big change to go through, then that's the way it has to be for some changes, unfortunately. And I'd love to jump Oh, go ahead, Charles. I was just going to say, and I think balance of, of risk here is important too. And I know, you know, Facebook probably lost, you know, a, a, a billion dollars, but I, I doubt anybody died because face, Facebook was out. And it, it, we all want to be perfect as teams. It does come down to, I think, balance of risk versus innovation, because there is a straight trade-off. There it, been, you know, maybe somebody wants to argue against me. I'd be interested in that conversation, but there is a straight trade-off between control and, and innovation and risk-taking. And, and I would argue this has happened at AWS with the Netflix outage a, f- a few years back. Um, it happens. And, and the, I think the real question is, does the value of the drive to innovation outweigh some of, some of the mistakes and the downtime? Um, and I think looking at both of those organizations, we'd all have to argue, yes, the short-term stock price took a hit. Long-term, there's no question that the drive to innovation uh, has balanced the, the, the risk. I'd love to jump back to our persona conversation. Um, and something that I'd like to hear from both of you is when you're thinking about your personas, are you baking in an educational journey of how maybe an intern comes in on day one and has the lowest level of responsibility and over time levels up within your tool to become a power user? Uh, Tom, do you want to take this one first? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, something that we've been using quite heavily is uh, Slack workflows. And these are really powerful. Like we, like we have like non-technical folks in digits and they can just put together these really powerful workflows. So we use that to kind of generate like um, a story or a journey for our new hires that whenever they come in. Um, they start up a workflow, it walks them through all the tools, it gives them working examples, it basically lets them level up um, their knowledge in the first week at Digit. And by the end of the first week, they understand why the tool exists, how to use it, how to use it safely. And we just, at the end of the day, we can also measure um, the onboarding process so we can see how long it took folks to perform certain um, tasks within the onboarding. Um, and it's just something that we can kind of review at the end of each sprint and say, like, can we improve this? Whereas before the onboarding was fairly ad hoc, uh, it was different for every team. Um, now that we have it inside a workflow, we can kind of track it much better. And yeah, it's just been awesome. Like we've got some really good feedback from new hires. They love that they just walk through it like a story or like a, a game or a journey. So yeah, that we got some really positive feedback. Yeah. And I've, I, one of the places that I think we can all learn from is games and i one of my principles is uh, as much as is is possible a a tool or a product should teach you how to use it and some of the most complex games i've i've played in the, in the beginning the game looks like it's about gathering rocks you know and, but by the end of it you've got technology trees and civilizations and economies and and negotiation and you know all of that it if you can get your product to do that, so very low sort of entry point, very clear what you're supposed to do, revealed complexity. So complexity is not in your face, but as you need the complexity, it reveals itself very easily. Um, these are all ways I think you can sort of smooth that kind of learning curve or transition. And, and if you're doing a good job, and, and, and by the way, to Tom's point, the, the product's not just the product. So things like um, you know, Slack and other tooling that helps guide people, documentation, that counts, right? So you don't necessarily have to do it all in the tool. Um, but yeah, that, I, that is absolutely a, a concern that you want to have to smooth onboarding, especially where your product's going out to someone you can't reach out and touch and talk to. Um, so it's great for internal efficiency on the team, but also if, if that product's going uh, out into a deployed mode and you can't necessarily be with that person, it becomes even more important. We had a question come in from Benjamin. He would like to know, what's an example of a no-code platform that most product or engineer engineering teams can use for something like UI prototypes? Are there platforms that we need to purchase or can we build ourselves? 
So I can actually give a little insight to this one first, if you guys don't mind. Stash has a homegrown tool that we use for this. Um, we do have some people, uh, are some of our web engineers using Storyboard, um, but most of the time we use a home role tool uh, for us and then on the product side and then also for our compliance team. You know, Stash is in the fintech space, highly regulated. Our compliance team is a key mem member of our build process. Um, so they're able to go in and look at things like copy designs and make sure that we're following the letter of the law. Uh, cool. Yeah, I don't really have any examples, but typically what I would do, um, I just like take one day out of my week and just call it like an evaluation day. I just go into Google and just Google all the no-code platforms, sign up for a bunch. And within a day, I can probably evaluate like maybe a dozen, just pick out the real best ones, put together a one pager, send it around. Um, just like new platforms and new tools coming online every day. So um, yeah, just if you can do like a really quick evaluation, just to narrow them down into the sort of areas and requirements that you have. And then from there, you can kind of share it around the team, get sort of wider feedback. Yeah, I, I also think it's important to think about what your goal is because there, there are loco no code tools that are very focused on market validation. Like I've, I've got an amazing idea. It's the best idea ever. No, it's not. <laughs> right. So how quickly can we figure out the, no, it's not, how do we iterate it? So there's a whole set of tools that are for folks that are more on the UX research side or the product management side to do validation. There's a whole other set of tools that are about how do I enable my interns or my you know business folks to participate in a development process that's for production. Um, and as Tom points out, the landscape is really changing uh, all the time. So I'd, I'd get clear on sort of where, what problem you're solving with the tool. Don't try to solve all the problems at, at once and, and then, you know, hit G2, hit the web, go, go see what's out there. All right, jumping back in, um, how can companies that deploy local products help empower their non-technical employees uh, specifically the ones with the business context um, to adopt and master no, no code, low code tools. So maybe it's uh, not a new employee. It's uh, someone that's been there for a while. I'm going to continue to pick on compliance. You have a compliance officer where you've developed something that can help them not have to do stuff as manually. How can you onboard them onto a new tool if they're kind of an embedded employee? Yeah, I, I would start by finding your, your champions. And I, just to give an analogy, maybe it'll work for people. In, in the analytics space, I always look for the person who's already found pivot tables. <laughs> or, or, or the v look, if you found the VLOOKUP function, I know I got you. Like, I'm, I can make an analyst out of you, right? So you, you've got to kind of find those people. And if you can find one or, or two, that's usually uh, enough. And you you get them through the learning curve, you get them producing, get some wins. You, we, we human beings are social creatures and that's real. People need to see somebody's been successful. Uh, and then they can help you onboard others. They can support others. You're going to get a ton of value just out of enabling them because they do have business contacts. Um, and you've been able to ramp them on the tools, but that, that my, my main, there's a lot more there, but that would be my main sort of advice is, is find your one or two that, that has a high chance of success and really invest, uh, in partnering with them. Oh uh, yeah, I totally agree. If you can find like advocates within the organization, uh, maybe run some workshops, kind of help them get up to speed, show them how it works. Um, show them how they can like create new workflows and share them with other teams and kind of use those folks to like spread the knowledge throughout your organization. Um, something else that we tried was um, we kind of looked at who was going to be using like the, the end tooling. And instead of bringing them towards the tooling, we tried to move the tooling closer to them. Um, mm -hmm. So product managers, for example, they spend a lot of their day in like spreadsheets and in Jira. Uh, so we tried to bring the tooling into their sort of area so we like um, we set it up so we could run our tools from um, like Google Sheet, for example. So they do their spreadsheet work and then just run our tools directly from there, where they can trigger tools using like a Jira API. So we tried to move the tools closer to the actual end, the end user, and that that worked quite well. Nice listening to your end user. I love it. <laughs> 
Um, Tom, you mentioned before that you sort of, you kind of touched on this process and I'd love to hear more about it. Reviewing the tools you have and seeing where you can iterate and improve on them. It sounded like you were doing it on a sprintly basis. Uh, yeah, yeah, we use sprints. Um, yeah, we try to standardize the look and feel of all our tools. So if you're using a tool, um, we've standardized like how you get support for the tool. We've standardized how you request new features, how you request fixes. So there's very, um, there's very low sort of mental load to actually working with these tools. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're using a tool to work with production or one to work with staging or dev, it all has the same look and feel. So again, it's, um, we've tried to reduce the barrier to entry for usage of the tools, but also if you want to extend the tools or work with us, we've also made that as easy as possible. And the developers really love that. The fact that they can just ping us like a new feature request and we can act on it quite, quite quickly. Charles, any insight on uh, bettering tools once they're in place? Yeah, I like it, it's on mid on on one of my sort of pet peeves. I don't, or maybe it's a peeve, but don't don't willy nilly introduce new concepts. So co cognitive load. So so it, look and feel is not just about look and feel. It's also about like have I invented whole new concepts here? And as as much as you can keep kind of the concepts and affordances smooth across context, you're, you're gonna get more adoption and it's gonna be easier to adapt fast. So um, that, that's a mistake that I will see sort of teams making is they, they've got a new problem to solve and they're not reusing perfectly good already existing concepts that their users have already learned and loved. Um, and that's, that's gonna slow the teams down in adopting those new features. So. So we've heard a lot of benefits. I would love to spend the last few minutes we have together discussing maybe the downsides or some risks we haven't mentioned yet. Um, Charles, do you want to start? Well, I think I think what folks tend to be worried about is, you know, I'm I'm going to take down Facebook, um, and I think that's <laughs> real, right? I mean, I think those 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 risks are those risks are real. I think there you 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 can definitely work. Uh, with those uh, with those risks and mitigate them, um, and I, I, they're, they're, one of the key challenges here is you, you also have to be good at people. So as we're as we're pushing tools out to to folks who are not used to the tools and they're not used to the disciplines associated with the tools, as Tom has said several times in this conversation, you've got to meet them where they're at. So can the interface be in Slack? Can the interface be in Google Sheets? Can I reduce how much of the concept they need to know so that they can be effective? So how much do I adapt to them? And where we don't do that, we're actually making their lives worse and our lives worse versus making it better. And I think the anytime we sort of say, hey, the tool's the solution, we just need to be careful about that. And I think a lot of the rush, there's a lot of benefits to low code, no code in the rush. That is a place where I see folks um, sometimes falling down as they say, hey, the tool is the solution and they're not helping the teams uh, on board and that's, that's holding them up. Um, I think also like having a bit of discipline in place as well and some guardrails early on is quite useful. Um, there is a bit of, um, you get a bit of an adrenaline rush after you've automated your first workflow. <laughs> if you're new to it, like you might create one workflow and it's perfect. So you create another 500. It just it can proliferate very, very quickly. So just like putting some guardrails in place, letting folks know like this is really cool, but this is what it's actually doing in the background. Maybe it's hitting a certain API. If you run this too much, you're going to like DDoS your own services. Um, <laughs> so just letting folks know that it's like, you don't have to go into too much detail, but just let them know what's using under the hood, just so they don't go and like abuse it by accident. So that's one of the biggest risks I see is folks kind of like accidentally like taking their own services offline because they're just hammering like an API endpoint. Yeah, yeah, got to remember to wear your helmet. <laughs> uh, we have another question that came in. What do we think will be made available by the democrat democratization of previously hidden things? Hmm. Well, this is what's cool. Who knows? And and I, it, seriously, I'm not being I'm not being flippant. I mean, if you if you told me that the main competitor to Hollywood and CBS would be a bunch of teenagers we've never met with their iPhones, 
who would have ever imagined that? That's called YouTube, TikTok. I, that is the reality we live in today. And these kinds of technologies really do have amazing transformational power. We can't we can't even anticipate. And that that is why I think like this push and enabling this push and this idea that there's not the business, like we, we, we shouldn't see it that way. We, we are a team collaborating to try to innovate. And I tend, I tend towards taking risks. Like Facebook going down for a day is awesome. People have learned some stuff, let me tell you. And we're all gonna benefit from that stuff that they've learned. And it, it really didn't hurt anybody that, that much, I suspect. If it, if it did, we should take that seriously. But there, I, I think this concept of low code, no code and enabling more people to participate in innovation, especially people who've got the context of interesting problems to solve, it's just hard to know uh, what value will be created. But as kind of a humanist and a technologist, I, I believe that there absolutely is value there that, that we just don't anticipate. Uh, I think from like uh, an organizational perspective, organizations that re rely heavily on senior engineers, senior developers, that's going to change a lot in the next decade. It's probably changing already. Um, teams that have the right tools, um, accessible tools that increase velocity, they'll just outmaneuver teams that have senior folks. So you could have a, a team of five interns with the right tools, could be outperforming a, a team of like senior engineers who are on high paid salaries. So it's kind of where I see no code thickness. I think like we're going to empower um, a much more junior workforce and a lot of innovation is going to come in through that. Um, it's going to be very exciting. It's good from a senior perspective as well because folks need to really like up their game and be on top of where they are. Um, well, and they want to focus on more interesting tasks too. I mean, yeah. there's a lot yeah. of stuff as a senior developer you don't want to be doing. It's just not worth your time. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's pretty exciting the next five, 10 years. It's going to be a uh, real sort of game changer. <laughs> Great. So we are at the end. Charles, Tom, thank you so much for joining us today.